Dump trucks are still working to haul snow off the streets in Buffalo, New York, creating large mountains of snow across the city. As the town attempts to dig out, the National Guard now going door to door, checking in on residents as the death toll rises. In more travel chaos for Southwest Airlines passengers, the company struggling to recover after the holiday storm. The CEO now apologizing, saying the airline's technology is outdated. Federal officials promising a full investigation. New COVID travel restrictions from the CDC targeting some passengers coming into the U.S. The country at the center of these new guidelines that's battling a surge in cases. Pope Francis's request for special prayers for his predecessor, Pope Benedict. The Vatican says the retired pontiff is very sick, but doctors are sharing about his declining health. Fallout and frustration at the southern border. Migrants are turned away after traveling for miles, often with no food. What happens now? Our Will Carr has the latest from the border. And life may be back to normal for some, but others are still experiencing symptoms long after their COVID infections, from breathing issues to brain fog. It feels like my brain is on fire, like it's being cooked on the daily. And last year, it was so intense that it was starting to cause me to have extremely violent involuntary body movements. Is enough being done to address this disability? And our Lindsay Davis sits down with actor Chris Hemsworth, the big screen superhero, now pushing the boundaries of his own mind and body. From ice baths and fasting to daredevil heights, what he and his family are saying about his new quest for longevity. Uh, I think what it gave me by the end of it was an even greater appreciation for what I have right in front of me and life. And well, good evening. I'm Trevor Alden for Lindsay Davis. Thank you for streaming with us. And we hope if you and your family have been traveling, you're successfully back home as the post Christmas travel meltdown drags on for the third straight day. Thousands of flight cancellations have stranded tens of thousands of Americans across the country, testing everybody's holiday spirits after the weekend winter storm. And at the center of the travel mess is Southwest Airlines, now under fire after canceling more than 13,000 flights since just last Wednesday. It has created unprecedented backlogs at our nation's airports during one of the busiest travel weeks of the year, with travelers stuck in long lines, others forced to sleep in the terminals for days as they desperately wait for the next flight out. And when the flights have taken off, some have landed and then left seas of unclaimed luggage, as you see in that startling video. And Southwest is now trying to explain how their systems failed how they're going to make it up to passengers. We begin tonight with ABC's Alex Perez covering it all for us at Chicago's Midway Airport. Tonight, Southwest Airlines under the microscope and facing more scrutiny. What this indicates is a system failure. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg vowing to investigate what has become one of the worst airline meltdowns ever. For the third straight day, Southwest canceling more than 60% of its flights. In all, more than 13,000 flights over the last week canceled, leaving passengers stranded and sleeping in airports. Unclaimed luggage piling up across the country. The airline still can't find Stephen Worley's bag. He was stuck in Atlanta for three days and says the debacle is costing him money he was counting on. I lose two days of holiday pay plus three days of regular pay because I was supposed to be back Sunday. Southwest CEO taking the blame and apologizing for the holiday travel nightmare. We have some real work to do. I want you to know that we're committed to that. While other airlines have recovered from last week's massive storm, Southwest's issue have lingered. Part of the problem, the airline's point-to-point -point operating system makes it vulnerable to major disruptions compared to other carriers routing flights through key hubs. We're focused on safely getting all of the pieces back into position uh, to end this rolling struggle. To reboot its system, Southwest limiting flights and repositioning planes with some carrying stranded luggage, but no passengers. Some passengers like Brendan Chavez aren't waiting for a new flight, renting a car to drive his frustrated family 25 hours from Kansas City to California. We'll probably end up wringing each other's necks by the end of it, potentially, but we'll see how it goes, I guess. In Texas, dozens of angry passengers arriving in Houston after driving 24 hours from New York City. 
Oh, I hate Southwest. Southwest. I hate them. And I need to drive nine more hours. My feet are swollen. I'm upset. I'm stressed. Southwest saying it will work on a case-by-case -case basis to refund passengers for, quote, reasonable travel expenses as the federal investigation now gains momentum. Question now is, of course, what do they consider reasonable expenses? Our Alex Perez now joins us from Midway International Airport in Chicago. Alex, of course, the situation for Southwest passengers, it's showing no signs of improving. But what about other airlines here? Are they trying to help out any way they can? Yeah, Trevor, a lot of people are turning to other airlines only to find sky-high prices for last-minute bookings. But United and Americans say they are putting caps on fares in big cities where they compete with Southwest to help people get home. Trevor? Of course, people finding those bags or trying to. We see them behind you. Alex Perez for us. Alex, thank you. And now to Buffalo, where the National Guard is going door-to-door -door checking for possible victims after that deadly and historic holiday blizzard. ABC's Mona Kosar Abdi has the latest as the snow melts and the city slowly digs out. Tonight, nearly a week after a 40-hour blizzard and more than four feet of snow paralyzed the region, the National Guard is still going door-to-door -door in Buffalo neighborhoods, checking on families. Because we are fearful that there are individuals who may have perished living alone or two people who are not doing well in, a, in an establishment, especially those that still don't have power. Why are you out on the road? There is a driving ban. With first responders working around the clock, some are taking advantage. Overnight, a storm chaser's live camera catching two people entering a family dollar store. They were arrested. Hundreds of vehicles were abandoned during the height of the storm. Johnny Lax is trying to get his fiance's car running. He says he walked an hour in the blizzard to rescue her Friday night. Just walking into the storm was just very hard. Like, I cannot explain to you. Like, I really can't use words to explain how bad it was. As the death toll rises, we're learning more about those who lost their lives. Monique Alexander's daughter, Casey, says her mom was the rock of their family, that she would cook for strangers on the holidays. The 52-year-old went out Christmas Eve never came back. So many families suffering and so many families waiting to learn how their loved ones are doing. Our Mona Koser Abdi joins us now from Buffalo. Mona, there's of course still a lot of work to do there, but are there any signs of a return to normalcy? There are, Trevor. Buffalo's mayor says all streets should be cleared by the end of the day today. Then the driving ban will be over. The airport opened early this morning, finally. And as you mentioned, signs of normalcy finally returning to Buffalo. Trevor? Okay, good to hear. Mona, thank you. And now as the weather clears up in the east, of course, heavy rain, gusty winds and snow, they're all moving into the west. So let's get right to our senior meteorologist, Rob Marciano. Rob, take us through the next 24, 48 hours or so. Well, we've got a series of storms coming into the West, Trevor, and one has already hit Portland and Seattle really hard with heavy rain and some damaging winds. The next wave in this atmospheric river that's pointed at the West is coming in tonight. That's going to hit Northern California and uh, Oregon and Washington once again. And the, the alerts are piling up here. We've got a lot of flood alerts because this is a warm weather system. Snow levels will be high but heavy, so avalanche warnings in place, and the winds will carry all the way over into the plain. So it times out to where we'll see the heavier rains develop tonight into Seattle and down all the way to Santa Barbara by tomorrow morning, and that presses into snow in the Sierras and heavy snow in, in the Wasatch of Utah and through the Intermountain West as well. And that kind of energy will tap some moisture in the Gulf and bring some heavy rain, it looks like, New Year's Eve uh, for the Northeast. And while that's happening, the next wave in this atmospheric river hits uh, Central California really hard with rain and snow, and that will have high impacts. But this all kind of pushes the warmth up in the east. Look how these numbers uh, climb near 70 in Atlanta on Sunday. And Buffalo, big melt there to the mid 50s as we approach New Year's Eve. There could be some flooding if those drainages uh, are not uh, kept clear, but nonetheless, a big warm-up as we head into New Year's Day. Trevor? All right, Rob Marciano for us. Rob, thank you. Well, today the U.S. announced new travel restrictions in response to surging COVID-19 infections in China. Here's ABC's Matt Rivers. As China struggles to deal with a crushing new wave of COVID infections, the CDC tonight announcing new restrictions on all travelers from China heading to the U.S. Starting January 5th, anyone traveling from China will be required to show proof of a negative PCR or antigen test taken within two days of departure. This is an unfortunate but necessary step. 
given the fact that we don't really know how much COVID there is in China, and we don't know the full spectrum of what variants there are. New images out of China showing overcrowded hospitals, patients waiting in the hallway, some unable to be seen. The surge following the Chinese government's decision to ease its so-called zero COVID policies a few weeks ago after rare protests sparked across the country. Mass testing and citywide lockdowns were suddenly abandoned, a rapid reopening that's resulted in what is likely millions of new cases, but China's government only reporting a handful of COVID deaths, fueling fears about its transparency. It comes as health experts here in the U.S. warn we could see a rise of new COVID cases after the holidays. And Matt joins us now. Matt, as these COVID cases are piling up in China, I know a lot of people are worrying about the threat of new variants. Are officials saying anything? Yeah, Trevor, basically what they're saying is that the more COVID spreads in China, the more potential there is for new variants. And we know that tracking variants accurately in China, there's really been a lack of ability to do so uh, throughout this pandemic in global databases. Trevor? Some deep concerns about that transparency. Matt Rivers for us tonight. Matt, thank you. And the other big international headline that developing news about the former head of the Catholic Church, Emeritus Pope Benedict's health has worsened. Vatican officials say doctors are constantly monitoring the 95-year-old's condition, and today Pope Francis was at the retired pontiff's bedside. ABC's Marcus Moore at the Vatican tonight. Tonight, Pope Francis calling for prayers for his predecessor, Benedict XVI. Una preghiera speciale per Papa Emerito Benedetto saying the Pope Emeritus is, quote, very sick. Benedict shocked the church and the world when he announced his retirement in 2013, the first pontiff to step down in nearly 600 years, citing, quote, a lack of strength of mind and body due to his age. The 95-year-old has kept a low profile, residing at the Vatican, giving up his famous red shoes for a quiet life, vowing to live, quote, hidden to the world. Recently, he has appeared frail and in declining health. Seen this summer with Francis, who has said having Benedict at the Vatican was like having a wise grandfather at home to turn to for advice. In 2005, at 78, he was the fifth oldest pope elected in the church's history. Born Joseph Ratzinger, he served as the Cardinal Archbishop of Munich in the late 70s and early 80s. Just this year, Benedict facing a damning report, accusing him of mishandling cases of sexual abuse by priests when he was head of the archdiocese. The church sexual abuse scandal plagued his papacy, and while he was the first pope to meet with victims... Indeed, I am deeply sorry for the pain and suffering the victims have endured. He also faced intense criticism for not holding church leaders accountable for covering up abuse. But perhaps the most notable part of his papacy was its abrupt end, a decision that could change the church forever. I thought it was a great act of humility to give up one of, well, the most powerful job uh, in the Catholic Church. Benedict has set the standard now. And Marcus Moore joins us now from the Vatican. Marcus, I know the updates are limited right now as far as Benedict's condition. Do we know anything about the care he's receiving? Yeah, Trevor, there has been no official update on his condition uh, other than that his condition has been worsening uh, from his, quote, advancing age. And we know that the retired pope has been at his home here at the Vatican recovering, uh, receiving care, and that Pope Francis went to visit him today as he put out that call for continued prayers. Trevor. All right, Marcus Moore for us at the Vatican. Marcus, thank you. We want to turn now to the crisis at our southern border and the fallout as the Supreme Court decided to allow Trump-era COVID restrictions on migrants seeking asylum to stay in place for now. Well, now thousands of migrants are left in limbo, unsure about what to do next. ABC's Will Carr is in Tijuana. Tonight, frustration and heartbreak for many after the Supreme Court extended the Trump-era immigration restriction known as Title 42, pending their full review of the case brought by several Republican-led states. For weeks, thousands of migrants, many traveling from as far away as South America, surging at the border, hoping to get through. Like Alexander Frietes, who says, I haven't given up yet. My dream is to cross to the other side. Border officials in Texas scrambling to build this tent-like facility to house and process up to 1,000 people. More infrastructure, more uh, facilities to be able to house these migrants just means that we're able to house these migrants in a, in a less crowded, in a safer, in a more humane manner. The Supreme Court majority suggesting that the White House has the legal authority to lift Title 42 if the president wants to. But the White House insists they're deferring to the court. 
Conservative Justice Neil Gorsuch siding with the Liberals, writing, Courts should not be in the business of perpetuating administrative edicts. We are a court of law, not policymakers of last resort. Tonight, the Biden administration says it will continue to follow the law, enforcing Title 42 into the new year. Trevor. All right, Will, thank you. Meanwhile, the firestorm is growing for a newly elected New York congressman who, before even taking office, has admitted to lying about his education and work history. He's already facing calls to resign, and tonight there's even more new scrutiny. Here's ABC's Aaron Katursky. Already caught lying about his background, tonight Congressman-elect George Santos is facing new scrutiny over his seeming leap from rags to riches. Sources telling ABC News federal prosecutors are now looking into his financial disclosures. It's not a formal investigation, but in 2020, Santos was earning $55,000. And two years later, he claimed assets worth up to $11 million. I come from abject poverty. I made some mistakes, and I own up to them. The and now I want to the, put this thing past is, me so I can deliver for the American people. Santos has admitted he made up much of his resume, lying about college and his career. Though last night on Fox, he seemed to backtrack. We can debate my resume and how I worked with firms such as it, Goldman is and Is it Citigroup debatable or is it just false? No, it's very debatable. I, no, I, no, it's not false at all. It's, it's debatable. And Santos played up his Jewish roots, even though he's Catholic. House Republican leader Kevin McCarthy even included Santos among Jewish Republicans to win office. Do you realize we have the largest Republican Jewish caucus in more than 24 years? That's Aaron Katursky reporting our thanks to him. And some sad news out of Congress. Maryland Congressman Jamie Raskin has announced he's been diagnosed with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, which is a serious but curable form of cancer. Raskin served on the January 6th committee. He'll be the top Democrat on the House Oversight Committee. He says the cancer was detected early. And he's expected to work through the start of chemo immunotherapy treatment. When we come back, the fallout for a Florida police officer seen on video appearing to drag a female suspect to jail. And Chris Hemsworth goes beyond his limit. The Thor actor tells us about his latest challenge, a National Geographic TV series, how he says his new show, Limitless, has bolted, tested both his body and mind. But first, brain fog, respiratory issues, and constant pain. While COVID symptoms end for many Many others struggle with them for years, and there appears to be little help on the horizon. Our Phil Lipoff brings us the stories of people still struggling with these life-altering effects of long COVID. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Bring your friends. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. 
With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. For the worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. With a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. So, what's good to read? And we mean really good to read right now. Well, that's where Charlie and Kate Gibson can help. Join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCnews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCnews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Well, take a look at this shocking scene. This is a car driving on top of a frozen canal. This was filmed by a group of friends who were ice skating in Indianapolis. They saw that car drive by, and they say it didn't last for long. That car broke through the ice. That group of skaters rushed in to pull the female driver to safety. Officials say that driver told them her GPS directed her onto the canal. but She was later arrested for driving while intoxicated. Well, it's been more than two and a half years since the first reported COVID case in the United States. And for most who have contracted COVID, the illness came and went. But according to the CDC, a range of symptoms still linger in nearly one in five American adults. From two women we spoke with, one in Boston, the other in Florida, those symptoms are debilitating, they're painful, and they're life-altering. Our Phil Lipoff brings us their stories. <laughs> Cheetah, Cheetah's rough. Mm -hmm. We're having so much fun with TT Nisha on her birthday. It's communicated. So it's a date I like to go back to. When I'm in denial, that maybe I am a hypochondriac. Hey, 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 this is my peace offering to you all. <laughs> maybe I'm being a drama queen. But then I go back to a picture I have on my phone. And when I see that person in the video, I realize I have never been that person since that week. Well, my doctor was the one who I called actually first. She said, well, Given your age and health, it should be no big deal. Just take some Tylenol and do some yoga. You're running, you're cycling, you're fit, and you're also 30. Across the country, hospitals are gearing up for influxes of patients. Surge tents popping up around Boston, San Jose, and Salt Lake City. When COVID hit, Nisha was perfectly healthy. She was living her dream, graduating from Boston's MIT in 2014 had her own nonprofit and was saving for a house with her partner. But after getting COVID in March of 2020, she was forced to put all of that on hold. Everyone who met me said, just give it a couple more weeks. The more they saw me slowly going downhill, everyone kind of switched to, you're developing some type of chronic condition. We don't know what it is. I'm terrified. I've, I've been terrified for the past year. I've been especially terrified the last six months. Month after month, her COVID symptoms persisted. And then Nisha started developing new conditions. It feels like my brain is on fire, like it's being cooked on the daily. And last year, it was so intense 
that it was starting to cause me to have extremely violent involuntary body movements. The seizure disorder was getting to the point that I could count the number of hours I could be conscious and functional on one hand. Struggling to find treatment, appointments were limited and doctors were skeptical. But then cases like hers began being reported across the United States and the world. And I had one specialist who at first was like, no, like it's probably nothing, it'll improve in a couple of months, have to come to me and go, my nurse, my right hand woman, she had COVID a couple months ago and everything I've seen with you, she's going through. Tonight, the number of cases of coronavirus spiking here in the U.S. Chinese officials are warning the virus could be even more contagious than first thought. I know people want to hear it's only going to be a matter of weeks and then everything's going to be fine. According to the CDC, one in 13 adults in the United States have had long-lasting COVID symptoms. The so-called long haulers have cleared the initial infection, but are left with symptoms that can last weeks, months, or even years. The symptoms of long COVID can affect different parts of the body, like the lungs, the heart, or the brain, according to the National Institutes of Health. The most common symptoms are fatigue, fever, respiratory problems, heart palpitations, digestive issues, and post-exertional malaise, meaning that symptoms get worse after physical or mental effort. Some of the difficulties we have right now is, as physicians, we don't have good tests. We don't have good biomarkers. So it's been two and a half plus years. We still don't have something where we can definitively diagnose it. Most people also report neurological problems, brain fog, headache, dizziness, pin and needle feelings, and sleep top the list. In many cases, the symptoms can be persistent and extremely debilitating. Even for physicians, long COVID is still not well understood. In some cases, patients have been left bed bound. There's a large number of people who are applying for disability right now. It's probably the number one diagnosis for people applying for social security and disability. I have to sit down and take a break. Walking back to my car. Life pre-COVID, I was a healthy, you know, 30 year old, I was finally obtaining, you know, my dream of becoming a firefighter paramedic. I worked years to do that. I coached soccer and cross country, basketball. Going from being somebody who's incredibly active, somebody who's incredibly fit, to being somebody who's stuck in their bed the majority of the time, struggling to find treatment and doctors who understand what we're dealing with in the masses is very frustrating. As a first responder, Karen became infected with COVID during the initial wave in 2020. Her COVID case was not as severe, but what came after was unexpected. I suffer from over 85 different symptoms, but it's a collection and overlapping of all of these medical conditions that I've developed as a result of having COVID-19. Just like Nisha, Karen's symptoms were so debilitating she was forced to stop working altogether. It is like running a marathon for the simplest of tasks. She can't coach or play soccer. A single mom, she tried applying for Social Security disability benefits, first in April of 2021, a process that took months only to get denied not once but twice. There's not a lot of resources for us right now. What does it look like for single parents like myself, who are the only breadwinners in the family, who are now unable to work, but are not qualifying for social security disability? To this day, and even as a first responder, Karen has received no financial assistance from the Social Security Administration. She decided to create a group to connect with other long haulers and quickly learned there were thousands of people having similar experiences all across the United States. The COVID-19 long hauler advocacy group alone has gathered more than 13,000 patients, many of them struggling to find treatment and access to disability benefits. So we're bringing agencies together to make sure Americans with long COVID who have a disability have access to the rights and resources that are due under the disability law. Even when President Biden announced more than a year ago that long COVID would be considered a disability, and the CDC recently announcing that four in five people with long COVID have trouble performing everyday activities, things haven't changed for people like Karen. Experts say cases like hers are the norm. People with long COVID are having a very difficult time accessing disability, even with the presidential memorandums. Emily Taylor, who has done research on disability for years, says in applying for disability benefits, the process is long and the paperwork substantial. 
Generally speaking, it can take up to two years. It's a long, extenuated process, especially with complex chronic illnesses like long COVID, where medical documentation is really difficult to achieve. Generally, it's about an 80% denial rate in the first round, and that was before the pandemic. So I expect that we're only going to see those numbers get worse as time goes on. In a statement, the Social Security Administration tells ABC News that disability evaluations are based on the limitations that affect an individual's ability to work, not a diagnosis. They also say that to date, they have flagged 40,000 disability claims that include indication of a COVID infection, representing 1% of the disability applications they have received lately, and that they don't have more data on these cases to share. But experts like Emily are seeing a pattern. And I think that's what's been happening with the people with long COVID is that they've been pushed out of a lot of the care systems and um, support networks that are meant to help people just like them. Lack of uh, belief, lack of ability to document their illness, lack of medical care providers that are specializing in that illness or even understand what they're looking at. Long COVID is absolutely a mass disabling event. If we were looking at a potential impact of 8 million people becoming chronically disabled, that is a mass exodus from the workforce and a mass disabling event. Just to assess your exercise tolerance. Almost three years now into the pandemic and without consensus regarding treatment, some hospitals have started opening up clinics to try and rehabilitate patients with long COVID. Some patients may have more predominant neurologic symptoms. Some patients have more cardiovascular symptoms. So there's not a cookie cutter way to provide care for this patient. We don't have clarity of, you know, if the patients will get better. We certainly have seen patients get better, but we also have seen other patients that are still struggling two years after their initial infection. Is that you try to keep Stay up on the with beat. the beat. Yeah. The National Institutes of Health is spearheading a $1.2 billion initiative to research and find treatment for long COVID. Yeah. 170, okay. Yeah. But the influx of patients is growing by the day, and the lack of treatment and resources is affecting American families. There are three bills sitting in Congress right now that would grant more funding for research and build more specialized clinics. A conservative estimate is 9 million people in America with long COVID. They want to get back to work. They want to be themselves. This is not in their heads. This is not something that is just to get out of work or a disability scam. These patients just want to be themselves again. It makes sense. You guys got it? Okay. Without resources or treatment in sight, after years of fighting, Nisha had no choice but to push herself to go back to work. Okay, forgive me. Because just like so many others living with long COVID, all she wants is to be who she was before she got sick. And I just want to go somewhere that my family can breathe for the first time two plus years. Because right now, they've not been able to not stress about me. I just want them to be able to experience what was my career beforehand, and them watching me twirl and teach and making science and engineering fun. And I want that moment back. Our thanks to Phil Lipoff for that report and still ahead here on Prime. The new plea from police in Idaho as they try to figure out who killed four college students. Plus, a man describes the terrifying moment he fell 40 feet during a rock climb. And the jackpot is growing. We take a look at the mega millions drawing by the numbers. First, our tweet of the day from NASA Earth. From the ground to all the way out in space, these are the best snapshots of 2022. at stake. So much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic. We're making magic.
so much at stake in our world right now. We wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. It's the type of place where you can walk home by yourself late at night. It really is the perfect college town. Police are investigating the death of a freshman. The victim had been stabbed 19 times. I have never seen that much blood in any crime scene. She was one of us. She was everyone's best friend. Could have been any of us. I was just really scared. While it's wonderful to think that you can leave your doors unlocked, don't. Death in the dorms, only on Hulu. Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Pole. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having the fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay! He's like the Justin Bieber of the <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Shut out. It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Pole. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Nat Geo Wild. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. So, what's good to read? And we mean really good to read right now. Well, that's where Charlie and Kate Gibson can help. Join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. The last Mega Millions of the year could bring someone a very happy new year. So here's a look at the jackpot by the numbers. $640 million, that is the estimated prize for Friday's drawing. It's by far the largest Mega Millions prize ever offered in the last week of the year. In fact, only five times in the 20 years the jackpot has soared past $600 million. Yet it does pale next to the $1.5 billion, the largest Mega Millions prize ever. And of course, a whopping $2 billion for the record. Powerball jackpot. One in 302.6 million. Those are your odds of winning a multi million dollar new year. But $2 is how much a ticket is going to cost you as long as you have a dream. And of course, if nobody wins the big one on Friday night, that jackpot is going to continue to grow in 2023. And we still have a ton to get to here on Prime. We have the big changes a group of entrepreneurs are pushing for the electric vehicle industry and the new developments for the suspects in the shooting of a beloved baseball icon. But first, to look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic. We're baby. making magic. It's the type of place where you can walk home by yourself late at night. It really is the perfect college town. Police are investigating the death of a freshman. The victim had been stabbed 19 times. I have never seen that much blood in any crime scene. She was one of us. She was everyone's best friend. Could have been any of us. I was just really scared. While it's wonderful to think that you can leave your doors unlocked, don't. Death in the dorms, only on Hulu. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt. True crime, 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live.
All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Airlines are still trying to recover from the backlog of cancellations due to the holiday storm. For Southwest, the problem is growing after a system meltdown. The CEO is apologizing for the more than 5,000 cancellations over the past two days. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg says Southwest will need to make it up to customers. Buffalo is still digging out from more than four feet of snow, and the city's mayor is pushing back on criticism by Erie County officials. It hasn't acted fast enough. I don't know where those comments are coming from people have been working around the clock uh, people have been working uh, without sleep Barry Croft Jr., the co-leader of the extremist plot to kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer, has been sentenced to more than 19 years in prison. It comes a day after his co-conspirator, Adam Fox, was sentenced to 16 years. The men were said to be furious over the governor's tough COVID-19 restrictions put in place during the early months of the pandemic, as well as fears she would place limits on gun ownership. Their defense attorneys argued the plot was just talk. The governor was never harmed. A Tampa police officer is fired after video shows him dragging a woman into jail. The police department says Gregory Damon violated department policies when he arrested the woman for trespassing last month. Police said the woman was refusing to leave the patrol vehicle when they arrived at the jail, telling the officer she wanted him to drag her. Surveillance and body camera videos show Damon dragging the woman across the concrete floor to the jail entrance. Police said two other officers helped lift the woman off the ground to start the intake process. The department said Damon also made rude and derogatory remarks towards the woman when she used vulgar language. The woman was uninjured in the incident. An Arizona teen missing for a little over a week has been found dead. Phoenix police say the body of 17-year-old Jesse Camacho was in rural Maricopa County. Camacho was taken from his home by two armed suspects on December 19th and forced into a dark-colored sedan. Police said another man inside the house at the time was shot during the incident. Police released surveillance photos but have not been able to identify the suspects. Ten people have been convicted in connection to the attempted murder of Hall of Fame baseball player David Ortiz. The alleged shooter, Rolfi Ferreira Cruz and Eddie Vladimir Feliz Garcia were each sentenced to 30 years in prison for the June 2019 shooting in the Dominican Republic. Eight defendants received sentences between 5 and 20 years. Three other defendants were acquitted due to insufficient evidence, including Victor Hugo Gomez Vasquez, the alleged mastermind behind the attack. Officials have said the target was supposed to be another man seated at Ortiz's table that night and that the shooter confused the two of them. The former Red Sox star was hospitalized for six weeks after the shooting. An ice climber is grateful to be alive after a harrowing 40-foot fall. Tim Thompson was climbing with a friend near Bridal Veil Falls in Utah when the ice he was stepping on gave way, causing him to fall and hit a ledge. Hopefully I don't die was kind of the first thought that went through my mind. Tim received help from a number of other climbers and emergency officials who quickly rescued him. Tim sustained two broken vertebrae in his back and a broken arm, but he still plans to climb next season. A lot of people, I think, would have something like this happen, deter them from doing it, but it's something I, you know, I'm so passionate about and love that I think you truly can make it safe. Tennis star Novak Djokovic is back in Australia for the first time since he was deported nearly a year ago. In January, he showed up for the Australian Open, but he refused to get vaccinated, breaking Australia's restrictions on travelers coming to the country at that time. But those rules no longer apply, and Djokovic is playing in the Adelaide International this weekend. He'll have a shot at the Australian Open title when the tournament begins January 15th. Police in Idaho have a new plea to the public in the search for the person who killed four college students nearly seven weeks ago. They say they want every tip and that even the smallest detail could help them crack the case. So far, there have been no arrests and no suspects identified. ABC's Mola Lange has the latest.
A new appeal for information to solve the November murders of four students from the University of Idaho. The Moscow Police Department put out a renewed call for social media content, pictures, and videos from the community, saying whether you believe it is significant or not, your information might be one of the puzzle pieces that helps solve these murders. Weeks after the deaths, with no word of a major break in the case, members of the community are on edge. Everybody's doing the best they can under duress. It's really stressful, and we're just waiting, hopefully, every day to hear some good news. The Moscow police also addressing the latest on that 2011 to 2013 Hyundai Elantra spotted near the scene, saying they have identified over 22,000 vehicles and that whoever was inside may have critical information about the case. Mystery has surrounded the murders of roommates Kaylee Gonsalves, Madison Mogan, and Zaina Kernodal, as well as Kernodal's boyfriend, Ethan Chapin, all stabbed to death inside a house. Two roommates on the ground floor survived. Police say they are not suspects and likely slept through the attack. Police say they have combed through thousands of leads, but have not announced suspects or persons of interest. Cole Alternator lived in that home on King Road in Moscow during his junior year. It's definitely an old creaky house. You can't walk up any of the stairs or on any of the floors without everybody in the house knowing it. The families growing desperate for answers as they face the holidays without their loved ones. Madison Mogan's dad telling the Spokesman Review he remains hopeful. From the very beginning, I've known that people don't get away with these things these days. There's too many things that you can get caught up on, like DNA and videos everywhere. Kaylee Gonsalves' father speaking with ABC just after Thanksgiving. It's a shame, you know, and everybody wants it to go away, and it needs to go away, but it can only go away when we have justice. A feeling echoed by those living in Moscow, worried about a killer on the loose. We need to find this person or persons now. That's Mola Lange reporting. We will, we've all heard of the benefits electric cars can have on the environment, but what if you have nowhere to charge them? Gio Benitez shows us how a new group of entrepreneurs is trying to make sure the electric vehicle revolution doesn't leave anybody behind. The electric vehicle revolution is sweeping the nation with sales of EVs and hybrids reaching more than 10% of the marketplace in 2021. But while President Biden has set a goal to get that number up to 50% by 2030, many communities find there's still a big obstacle in the way. We have no access to charging stations. It doesn't seem like it's reasonable to say to assume that it's possible for us to go electric here in this community when the infrastructure doesn't exist. Michael Johnson, co-founder of the advocacy group South Bronx Unite, said switching to EVs isn't just about the environment, it's about their health. 17% of children in South Bronx have asthma. That's 6% higher than in other parts of the city. We're literally being choked by the emissions from vehicles, both cars and trucks. So electrifying vehicles would help better our air quality. There are lots of incentives to get more people driving electric vehicles, but not enough infrastructure to support it. Areas like this one where charging stations aren't easy to find, they're called charging deserts. So right now, come with me because we're actually gonna drive to a charging station. It's the closest one, and it's about 15 minutes away. So let's go. So here it is, we're inside a parking garage, and this is that one charging station. And it's pretty incredible that in this whole area, this is it. But there are solutions in sight. New York City is working to install 1,000 public EV chargers by 2025 and told ABC News it recognizes the need to get more chargers to boroughs like the South Bronx, saying, we will continue to work closely with our partners to support the transition to EVs among all drivers in the city. In the coming years, the federal government is handing out $5 billion to fund charging along highways and $2.5 billion for chargers in residential areas, especially for rural and underserved communities. And in America's Motor City, a group of Black-owned businesses are working to make sure that influx of money goes to their businesses and their communities. I'm Natalie King. I'm the founder and CEO of Dunamis Charge. I am founder CEO of VIA. And I am the CEO and co-founder of Charger Health. I'm founder and CEO of Walker Miller Energy Services. These entrepreneurs make up a new trade association called BEVI, Blacks in Electric Vehicle Infrastructure. 
King's company aims to empower everyone with access to clean energy and EV chargers manufactured right in the city of Detroit. There are a lot of communities that are saying, hey, that's just for rich people, you know, that's just for certain high wealth individuals, but EV is for everyone. But it's not just about making charging stations. These entrepreneurs are involved in every stage of the process. Charging stations break, we fix them. And what we've seen across the United States as we deploy more infrastructure, there's a huge, huge gap in reliability of the charging infrastructure. One of my biggest fears, the things that keeps me up at night, is the fact that we are creating an energy divide. King said these efforts can especially help communities like the South Bronx that are being hurt by greenhouse gas emissions and pollution. If you're coming out of your home, and you're waking up to a smokestack or you're not able to drink clean water. Incorporating clean energy technology, electric vehicle technology in these communities are a very holistic approach to counteract those negative impacts. Our thanks to Gio Benitez. Well, he's known for depicting superhero strength on the big screen, but now on the small screen, Chris Hemsworth is pushing the limits of his own mental, emotional, and physical capacity in National Geographic's new show, Limitless. The actor is trying to apply some new findings for medical science about how to extend our longevity. Our Lindsay Davis met up with the actor who plays Thor himself to talk about what he calls a life-changing experience on his quest to find a way to live better for longer. I will not fight you, brother! I'm not your brother. Audiences are no stranger to heart-pounding action and adventure when Chris Hemsworth is on the screen. Forgive me, Jay. And now the star of Marvel's Thor is taking on his toughest challenge yet. So you're probably asking yourself why I'm dangling off a rope a thousand feet off the ground. I'm asking the same question. Well, Disney wanted to make a show about longevity. Turns out this has something to do with it. On the new Nat Geo series Limitless, Hemsworth pushes himself to his mental and physical limit, all in the name of longevity. <laughs> what are you thinking? Oh, nothing. Just trying to enjoy the view and be comfortable in a very uncomfortable situation. <laughs> How are you approached about doing Limitless? Darren Aronofsky uh, called me up and said, I want to do this doc series on longevity. And, um, you know, I have, I've been pretty health conscious uh, through my life and trained a lot and a pretty good sense of nutrition and so on. But in the space of longevity, I was, it was all incredibly new and um, unknown territory for me. Was there any hesitation? I don't think I knew what the show was when I was first asked <laughs> to do it. <laughs> I think if, um, and nor do I think even the producers on the show, Darren, the thing organically grew uh, over the two years we shot it. And each challenge, you know, often started small and advanced throughout the experience. Initially, it was about, you know, cold water immersion and I'd be doing some ice baths. And then before I know it, we're flying into Norway and I'm swimming in the Arctic Ocean. Oh, I can't skip it. But his wife wasn't so enthusiastic. I feel like I'm dying. I can't. You actually oh, probably are. My wife, a couple of times, said, hang on, you're, you're walking out on a crane that's the, the up top of the skyscraper, and, OK, you're going to climb a rope that's a 1,000 feet off the ground, and you're going to swim in the Arctic. Action. You were preparing for the role of Thor at the same time. Mm. Was there any part that the studio executives thought, you're doing what? <laughs> if it wasn't also a Disney production, I'm not sure that they would have let me do it at all. Uh, but when I ruptured my ankle, they stepped in and said, you can do this challenge after we finish shooting the movie. What was most challenging? Each episode was, um, was challenging and tough in different ways. The four-day fast was, water-only fast, was very intense, um, especially I, you know, come off shooting Thor, where I was continuously eating and having as many calories as I could. Climbing the rope. What I'm proposing is you dangle at the bottom, climb all the way up. The shock episode, swimming in Norway in, in freezing conditions, that, that, that felt like, you know, a thousand ice cream headaches <laughs> being driven into my head at once. My, my limbs felt like lead balloons. So a lot of it became the sort of mental fortitude and, and, you know, trusting the science and the people that were guiding me through these experiences and kind of just head down and go for it. What we thought we'd do, Chris, is just talk you through the plan, so you've got a rough idea as to what you're going into. 
So the main risk is really that the longer you spend in the water, the risk goes up exponentially. If you push yourself beyond the point at which you should be coming out, there is a real risk you could die. So the basic idea here is that there's so much new scientific research about how you can best unlock your own superpowers, right? Mm -hmm. What did you learn about that that you feel like, hmm, these, there might actually be something here? Every day was a educational experience for me. Um, and I continue to do a lot of the things I learned throughout the show. It, being able to, to share that on a larger platform with many people and, and have it be something that is easily accessible and to have sort of me be the guinea pig throughout it and hopefully have people go, oh, okay, cool, we're, we, we all have the same sort of challenges and stresses and also opportunities at our fingertips to be in the driver's seat and say, I want to make this change, or I, want to, I want to try this. You've said before that you've never experienced anything like this, like Limitless and what mm. you've undergone. How so? How was this so different from, you know, all the, I imagine, really grueling and intense training when you're mm -hmm. becoming Thor? The fact that I'm playing myself too, I'm not hiding behind the character, but you're very exposed when it's just you up there. I sort of welcomed the opportunity to do that, you know, because it was, it was a different experience. Was there any aspect of it that you were like, I'm a real life superhero? <laughs> <laughs> Most of the time I was just sort of getting the end of it. I was like, do we get the shot? Are we rolling there? Because I'm not doing it again. <laughs> Despite his seemingly superhuman abilities, the star's toughest challenge went well below the surface. Today we're going to talk about your mortality. Okay. Okay? Yeah. So we have a little exercise prepared for you, a little bit of exposure therapy. The final episode, the acceptance episode, where um, I was forced to confront my own death and my own mortality, and uh, it, it was an immersive theatre experience. Um, that was that was unlike anything I've ever done. Uh, I think what it gave me by the end of it was an even greater appreciation for what I have right in front of me and life and wonderful family and friends and, and what an incredible time I've had through life and and, um, and to carry that through my days, you know, and I think it makes, uh, you know, take nothing for granted. Any of your Marvel co-stars who you'd <laughs> like to see uh, participate in mm. Limitless season two? <laughs> um, Scarlett Johansson. Okay, all right, all right, we'll get a woman in there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think she'd, she'd she put me to shame. <laughs> Let's get on with it, shall we? All right, our thanks to Lindsay Davis. And before we go tonight, the image of the day, a much icier take on walking in a winter wonderland. This is the waterfront community of Crystal Beach in Fort Erie, Ontario. As you can see, entirely encased in ice following a snowstorm that knocked out power to thousands in the area. Unclear if Chris Hemsworth is going to try to take a swim there. That is our show for this hour. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thank you for streaming with us and have a great night. Coming up in the next hour, we're staying on top of several stories. Why an alleged serial killer accused of killing six men is now facing even more charges. Plus, where this tornado touched down, leaving a trail of destruction in its wake. at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? 
behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasure that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the Table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter. And it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. We're honored. ABC's 2020, winner of three Emmy Awards for Excellence. Thank you for making 2020 Friday night's most watched and most honored news magazine. This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic. We're making magic. Good evening, I'm Trevor Alden for Lindsay Davis. Thank you for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. As COVID infections surge in China, the U.S. is imposing new travel restrictions. The White House announced today people coming from China, Hong Kong, and Macau have to show proof of a negative test before boarding their flights. Several other countries have taken similar steps. Lunar New Year begins January 22nd. That's China's busiest travel season. Well, the losing candidate of Arizona's governor's race has won at least a partial victory, or at least she can proceed in some areas as she works to throw out the results entirely. Republican Carrie Lake has presented a 10-point lawsuit arguing her loss by 17,000 votes to Democrat Katie Hobbs was the result of a rigged election. Well, a Maricopa County Superior Court judge has dismissed eight of the 10 claims, but ruled that two of them pertaining to allegations of printer malfunctions and ballot chain of custody could proceed. Now, Lake herself has hailed this decision as a victory, tweeting, quote, buckle up, America. This is far from over. An alleged serial killer in the California city of Stockton has been linked to a seventh murder in the region. Wesley Brownlee was arrested in October in connection with the unprovoked murders of six men who were fatally shot between April of 2021 and September 2022. According to police, a motive for the killings is not known. Well, now to the travel meltdown across the country with thousands of flight cancellations, leaving tens of thousands of Americans stranded, testing everyone's holiday spirits after the weekend winter storm. Southwest is at the center of the travel storm now, trying to explain how their systems failed and how they're going to make it up to passengers. Here's ABC's Alex Perez at Chicago's Midway Airport. Tonight, Southwest Airlines under the microscope and facing more scrutiny. What this indicates is a system failure. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg vowing to investigate what has become one of the worst airline meltdowns ever. For the third straight day, Southwest canceling more than 60% of its flights. In all, more than 13,000 flights over the last week canceled, leaving passengers stranded and sleeping in airports. Unclaimed luggage piling up across the country. The airline still can't find Stephen Worley's bag. He was stuck in Atlanta for three days and says the debacle is costing him money he was counting on. I lose two days of holiday pay plus three days of regular pay because I was supposed to be back Sunday. Southwest CEO taking the blame and apologizing for the holiday travel nightmare. We have some real work to do. I want you to know that we're committed to that. While other airlines have recovered from last week's massive storm, Southwest's issue have lingered. Part of the problem, the airline's point-to-point -point operating system makes it vulnerable to major disruptions compared to other carriers routing flights through key hubs. We're focused on safely getting all of the pieces back into position uh, to end this rolling struggle. To reboot its system, Southwest limiting flights and repositioning planes with some carrying stranded luggage, but no passengers. Some passengers like Brendan Chavez aren't waiting for a new flight, renting a car to drive his frustrated family 25 hours from Kansas City to California. We'll probably end up bringing each other's necks by the end of it, potentially, but we'll see how it goes, I guess. 
In Texas, dozens of angry passengers arriving in Houston after driving 24 hours from New York City. Oh, I hate Southwest. Southwest. I hate them. I need to drive nine more hours. My feet are swollen. I'm upset. I'm stressed. Southwest saying it will work on a case-by-case -case basis to refund passengers for, quote, reasonable travel expenses as the federal investigation now gains momentum. Question now is, of course, what do they consider reasonable expenses? Our Alex Perez now joins us from Midway International Airport in Chicago. Alex, of course, the situation for Southwest passengers, it's showing no signs of improving. But what about other airlines here? Are they trying to help out any way they can? Yeah, Trevor, a lot of people are turning to other airlines only to find sky-high prices for last-minute bookings. But United and Americans say they are putting caps on fares in big cities where they compete with Southwest to help people get home. Trevor? Of course, people finding those bags or trying to. We see them behind you. Alex Perez for us. Alex, thank you. And now to Buffalo, where the National Guard is going door to door, checking for possible victims after a deadly and historic holiday blizzard. ABC's Motocoaster Abdi has the latest as the snow melts and the city slowly digs itself out. Tonight, nearly a week after a 40 hour blizzard and more than four feet of snow paralyzed the region, the National Guard is still going door to door in Buffalo neighborhoods, checking on families. Because we are fearful that there are individuals who may have perished living alone or two people who are not doing well in, a, in an establishment, especially those that still don't have power. Why are you out on the road? There is a driving ban. With first responders working around the clock, some are taking advantage. Overnight, a storm chaser's live camera catching two people entering a family dollar store. They were arrested. Hundreds of vehicles were abandoned during the height of the storm. Johnny Lax is trying to get his fiance's car running. He says he walked an hour in the blizzard to rescue her Friday night. Just walking into the storm was just very hard. Like, I cannot explain to you. Like, I really can't use words to explain how bad it was. As the death toll rises, we're learning more about those who lost their lives. Monique Alexander's daughter, Casey, says her mom was the rock of their family, that she would cook for strangers on the holidays. The 52-year-old went out Christmas Eve never came back. So many families suffering and so many families waiting to learn how their loved ones are doing. Our Mona Koser Abdi joins us now from Buffalo. Mona, there's of course still a lot of work to do there, but are there any signs of a return to normalcy? There are, Trevor. Buffalo's mayor says all streets should be cleared by the end of the day today. Then the driving ban will be over. The airport opened early this morning, finally. And as you mentioned, signs of normalcy finally returning to Buffalo. Trevor? Okay, good to hear. Mona, thank you. And now as the weather clears up in the east, of course, heavy rain, gusty winds and snow, they're all moving into the west. So let's get right to our senior meteorologist, Rob Marciano. Rob, take us through the next 24, 48 hours or so. Well, we've got a series of storms coming into the west, Trevor, and one has already hit Portland and Seattle really hard with heavy rain and some damaging winds. The next wave in this atmospheric river that's pointed at the west is coming in tonight. That's going to hit Northern California and uh, Oregon and Washington once again. And the, the alerts are piling up here. We've got a lot of flood alerts because this is a warm weather system. Snow levels will be high but heavy, so avalanche warnings in place, and the winds will carry all the way over into the plains. So it times out to where we'll see the heavier rains the, develop tonight into Seattle and down all the way to Santa Barbara by tomorrow morning and that presses into snow in the Sierras and heavy snow and in, in the Wasatch of Utah and through the Intermountain West as well and that kind of energy will tap some moisture in the Gulf and bring some heavy rain it looks like New Year's Eve uh, for the Northeast and while that's happening the next wave in this atmospheric river hits uh, Central California really hard with rain and snow and that will have high impacts but this all kind of pushes the warmth up in the east look how these numbers uh, climb near 70 in Atlanta on Sunday and Buffalo big melt there to the mid 50s as we approach New Year's Eve. There could be some flooding if those drainages uh, are not uh, kept clear, but nonetheless, a big warm-up as we head into New Year's Day. Trevor? All right, Rob Marciano for us. Rob, thank you. Overseas tonight, we're following news. Emeritus Pope Benedict's health has worsened. Vatican officials say doctors are constantly monitoring the 95-year-old's condition, and today, Pope Francis was at the retired pontiff's bedside. ABC's Marcus Moore at the Vatican tonight. Tonight, Pope Francis calling for prayers for his predecessor, Benedict XVI. Una preghiera speciale per Papa Emerito Benedetto. Saying the Pope Emeritus is, quote, very sick. 
Benedict shocked the church and the world when he announced his retirement in 2013, the first pontiff to step down in nearly 600 years, citing, quote, a lack of strength of mind and body due to his age. The 95-year-old has kept a low profile, residing at the Vatican, giving up his famous red shoes for a quiet life, vowing to live, quote, hidden to the world. Recently, he has appeared frail and in declining health. Seen this summer with Francis, who has said having Benedict at the Vatican was like having a wise grandfather at home to turn to for advice. In 2005, at 78, he was the fifth oldest pope elected in the church's history. Born Joseph Ratzinger, he served as the Cardinal Archbishop of Munich in the late 70s and early 80s. Just this year, Benedict facing a damning report, accusing him of mishandling cases of sexual abuse by priests when he was head of the archdiocese. The church sexual abuse scandal plagued his papacy, and while he was the first pope to meet with victims... Indeed, I am deeply sorry for the pain and suffering the victims have endured. He also faced intense criticism for not holding church leaders accountable for covering up abuse. But perhaps the most notable part of his papacy was its abrupt end, a decision that could change the church forever. I thought it was a great act of humility to give up one of the, well, the most powerful job uh, in the Catholic Church. Benedict has set the standard now. And Marcus Moore joins us now from the Vatican. Marcus, I know the updates are limited right now as far as Benedict's condition. Do we know anything about the care he's receiving? Yeah, Trevor, there has been no official update on his condition uh, other than that his condition has been worsening uh, from his, quote, advancing age. And we know that the retired pope has been at his home here at the Vatican recovering, uh, receiving care, and that Pope Francis went to visit him today as he put out that call for continued prayers. Trevor. All right, Marcus Moore for us at the Vatican. Marcus, thank you. Turning now to the crisis at our southern border and the fallout after the Supreme Court decided to allow Trump-era COVID restrictions on migrants seeking asylum to stay in place for now. Now, thousands of migrants are left in limbo, unsure about what to do next. ABC's Will Carr is in Tijuana. Tonight, frustration and heartbreak for many after the Supreme Court extended the Trump-era immigration restriction known as Title 42, pending their full review of the case brought by several Republican-led states. For weeks, thousands of migrants, many traveling from as far away as South America, surging at the border, hoping to get through. Like Alexander Frietes, who says, I haven't given up yet. My dream is to cross to the other side. Border officials in Texas scrambling to build this tent-like facility to house and process up to 1,000 people. More infrastructure, more uh, facilities to be able to house these migrants just means that we're able to house these migrants in a, in a less crowded and a safer and a more humane manner. The Supreme Court majority suggesting that the White House has the legal authority to lift Title 42 if the president wants to, but the White House insists they're deferring to the court. Conservative Justice Neil Gorsuch siding with the liberals, writing, Court should not be in the business of perpetuating administrative edicts. We are a court of law, not policymakers of last resort. Will Carr for us. Will, thank you. Next, the newly elected New York congressman, who before even taking office has admitted lying about his education and work history. Now he's facing calls to resign and even more new scrutiny. ABC's Aaron Katursky has more. Already caught lying about his background, tonight Congressman-elect George Santos is facing new scrutiny over his seeming leap from rags to riches. Sources telling ABC News federal prosecutors are now looking into his financial disclosures. It's not a formal investigation, but in 2020, Santos was earning $55,000, and two years later, he claimed assets worth up to $11 million. I come from abject poverty. I made some mistakes, and I own up to them. The and now I want to the, put this thing past is, me so I can deliver for the American people. Santos has admitted he made up much of his resume, lying about college and his career. Though last night on Fox, he seemed to backtrack. We can debate my resume and how I worked with firms such as it, Goldman is and Is it Citigroup debatable or is it long, just false? But, uh, no, is it's it very, debatable no, or is it just debatable. false? I, no, I, no, it's not false at all. It's it's debatable. And Santos played up his Jewish roots, even though he's Catholic. House Republican leader Kevin McCarthy even included Santos among Jewish Republicans to win office. Do you realize we have the largest Republican Jewish caucus in more than 24 years? 
That's Aaron Katursky reporting. The Mega Millions jackpot climbed to at least $640 million after nobody won in yesterday's drawing. The lottery says it's the largest prize ever offered in the final week of the year. ABC's Doreen Shaw has the story on your next chance to win big. Let's see if I can make you a millionaire tonight. Friday's Mega Millions jackpot has grown to at least $640 million. Ticket sales now taking off across the country. Experts say we're seeing more of these big lotto prizes because as the jackpot grows, so does the idea of winning. And that leads to more people buying tickets. Want to see it? The jackpot has been growing since mid-October, and it all comes after one person in Southern California won the record-breaking $2 billion jackpot. We wait for someone to come forward with that winning ticket. And even once they do, there's a really thorough process to make sure that that prize claim is legitimate. And while the lotto goes through a really thorough process with the winner, so should you if you end up winning. Experts say there are a series of things you should do first if you win. Find a team of professionals to get advice on the new wealth. Everything from an accountant to an attorney to a bookkeeper to a financial and tax advisor. Work with a team to think about what you want to focus the win on and make long and short-term plans. Pay off all your debt and create a new budget. Our thanks to Zoreen Shah and still to come, how a chess player is using an international competition to join in on protests against the Iranian government. Plus, the Woman King brings us inside an all-female fighting force that protects their African kingdom. Our Lindsay Davis sat down with star Lashana Lynch to discuss bringing this legendary sisterhood to life. This is ABC News Live. The crushing of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Can <laughs> <laughs> I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. We're tracking several headlines around the world. For a second day, an Iranian chess player participated in an international tournament in Kazakhstan without a hijab. The 25-year-old player is just the latest example of Iranians standing up against their government. The uprisings there, though, have taken a deadly turn, with at least 476 protesters killed in Iran, and at least 100 are facing execution, death penalty charges, or sentences, according to the Iran Human Rights Group. A court in the Dominican Republic convicted 10 of the 13 people accused of attempting to murder former Major League Baseball star David Ortiz in Santo Domingo back in 2019. They're facing between 5 and 30 years in prison, but the alleged master mind of the attack is one of the three defendants who were acquitted because of insufficient evidence. 
And take a look at this massive snake-like tornado that spiraled through western Bolivia. This formed in a matter of minutes. It lifted roofs and it damaged at least five homes. Well, turning now to our next guest, she has played an agent in the James Bond franchise, a pilot in Captain Marvel, and now Lashana Lynch is portraying a warrior. It's in a film also starring Viola Davis and John Boyega. Lynch is helping to bring a story to life that's based on the real African kingdom of Dahomey. Our Lindsay Davis spoke to Lashana about this fierce sisterhood fighting against slavery and the groundbreaking representation in The Woman King. Take a look. An evil is coming, but we have a weapon. They are not prepared for. I'm ready for people to feel the energy of the film, because there's a story, there's a history, there's a women, there's Viola Davis. <laughs> um, and then there's the energy of the film. You're asking me to take them to war. Some things are worth fighting for. And you mentioned Viola Davis. What was it like to work with her? Amazing. She's so she's such a lovely, warm, really grounded person who cares about the craft. She cared so much for us as human beings, as black women, as artists. We mm. were really collaborative throughout the whole process. It didn't feel like it was Viola Davis, she's the lead. It felt like we we're all just creating this thing together, which is exactly how it should be. And, and part of it on screen is about this unbreakable bond, the sisterhood. Mm. It, it feels so genuine and authentic and, and pure. What do you do behind the scenes in order to, to really affect that? We didn't do anything. Mm. We just showed up. I, I don't know if it's a, you know, a shorthand that we have as black women mm. when we come into a space and we're just like, we know what we need to do. Or if it was just understanding what the assignment was. You know, we want to tell our story authentically. We want to represent our ancestors in the way that they deserve. <laughs> And you mentioned the ancestors, and that mm. kind of struck me in a way, right? That there, it almost feels like there's a, a responsibility. There's there's this weight of history when you're actually depicting, you know, Africa as this thriving, wealthy place that is some, and, and that's something that we don't often see. I do think we have a responsibility as people in the public eye, artists, musicians, actors, to really take what we have, what we built ourselves to, and take care of our history backwards, heal backwards, tell our stories in the way that maybe people who don't look like us wouldn't be able to tell. So when you have someone like Gina, Viola, Julius in charge, you already know that the, the project is taken care of. You know that you're taken care of as a black woman. You know that your ancestors aren't gonna be rolling in their grave, you know, <laughs> thinking why are they representing us in that way. And as a warrior that you play, I mean, you are just a tough, <laughs> Bad bleep. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and you talked about being uh, all oiled up in the and the fighting. And, yeah. and how did you prepare? And do you do your own stunts? Yeah, that's impressive. I've done some stunts in the past, but they've been, I want to say, fifty percent, if that, because of danger, insurance. <laughs> but with this one, Gina was really determined to have us do it 100%. She didn't want to cut away to someone's cheek, mm. back of the head, you know. She wanted us, us to be able to live, eat and breathe these women so that even on our days off, we were still doing an hour and a half of weight training, then straight into three plus hours of stunts, choreography, repetition. And it meant that I was able to characterize Azogi in the most authentic way. She literally came from my core, because my core was being built <laughs> at the time when I was trying to find who she was. And that's special. Do you feel that Izogi made you tougher as a person? Ooh. I actually, on the contrary, think that she made me softer. Mm. Um, in her being so tough, and me learning what it means to be the strong black woman and me not wanting to use that phrase anymore for myself or for the people I care about. She made me pay attention to the nuances of my experience, my vulnerability, um, my fears, all of the things that come with me that make me proud of being me. And with her, she's so tough on the outside, no one really gets to see her sensitive side. 
But I question, what does she do at night? You know, what does she dream about? What are her fears? Um, what does she see when she looks at these young people she's about to train? Are we training to cook? You are caught in a body, not a young. What is she saying to her younger self, you know? Um, so, yeah, I think she, she ironed me out a little bit, which is quite nice. I'm also interested in the idea of colorism. You know, we've, we've talked to a number of black actresses in the past about um, that, that, that often the roles might be there only for the fairer skin mm. uh, black women. Do you feel that it was intentional in this particular movie to make sure that there was, uh, we're really going to go in and not just have, you know, a light skin and, and a complexion issue uh, on set with the cast? Yeah, I do. I won't speak for Gina, but I know that there was a concerted effort to ensure that us as black women felt like we were seeing ourselves as actors around the set. And that's the, the actors, that's the supporting artists, that's the crew. It does something to us as, as dark-skinned women to be empowered by the other people that are around us every single time we look around. And not like it would do the opposite if we didn't see someone who looked like us, but with telling a story like this about our ancestors, it doesn't mean that this is the one way or the highway, you know, or the highway. It means that we now have a realistic, non-superhero example of what dark-skinned women can be. Our thanks to Lindsay Davis. And still to come, we have a behind-the-scenes look at preparations for America's biggest New Year's Eve celebration. It's the type of place where you can walk home by yourself late at night. It really is the perfect college town. Police are investigating the death of a freshman. The victim had been stabbed 19 times. I have never seen that much blood in any crime scene. She was one of us. She was everyone's best friend. Could have been any of us. I was just really scared. While it's wonderful to think that you can leave your doors unlocked, don't. Death in the dorms, only on Hulu. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Pole. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having the fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay. He's like the Justin Bieber of the <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Shut out. It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Pole. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Net Geo Wild. Well, listen, it's been a difficult, it's been a frustrating few years for a lot of us. And with 2023 just a few days away, New Yorkers gathered today in Times Square for the 16th annual Good Riddance Day. People wrote down their bad memories, their greatest fails, their biggest regrets from 2022. They put it on official Good Riddance Day forms so that they could be discarded before then the participants broke through that finish line into 2023. Good Riddance Day is inspired by a Latin American tradition where New Year's revelers stuff dolls with objects representing bad memories before they set them on fire. And of course, in just a few days, there's going to be a whole lot more people in Times Square to ring in the new year. And our Will Gans gives us a look behind the scenes as they get ready to drop the ball. Five, four. The countdown is officially on to 2023. In Port Clinton, Ohio, they'll mark the new year by dropping a giant walleye named Wiley. Panama City, Florida drops a beach ball, naturally. And in Princess Anne, Maryland, they'll celebrate with a stuffed muskrat dive. Three, two, one! But the main event will be here in Times Square, New York City. You know, it's like our Eiffel Tower or Great Wall of China or something. It's something that Americans just really connect to. Final preparations underway for the party of the year and everyone is on the guest list. We have found ways to carry on our traditions each year during the pandemic. And this year we are welcoming the world back without any restrictions. So come early, get a great space and happy new year.
And that iconic star of the celebration, the Times Square Ball, 12 feet in diameter with over 2,600 crystal panels. The 2023 theme of this year's Waterford Crystal Design, Gift of Love. We need this after the pandemic. We've all gone through a horrendous two years. We've come out the other side of it and we've come out better. The ball weighs over 11,000 pounds, which is more than two Chevy Tahoes. Then a few days from now, New Year's Eve, 1.2 billion people approximately around the world watching the ball drop. Ryan Seacrest hosting the New Year's Rock and Eve celebration for his 18th year in a row, counting down to 2023 with some of his own favorite moments of New Year's Eve's gone by. From Taylor to Mimi, to Dick Clark himself. There's no other moment like it where we're all doing the same thing at the same time, filled with hope for 2023. Our thanks to Will Gans, and that's our show for tonight. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Trevor Alt. Thanks for streaming with us.